you've forgotten that once we were brought here, we were robbed of our name, robbed of our language. We lost our religion, our culture, our God. And many of us, by the way we act, even lost our minds. Why should the black man in America uh, concern himself since we've been away from the African continent for 400 years, three or 400 years? Why should we concern ourselves? What impact does what happened to them have upon us? Number one, first you have to realize that up until 1959, Africa was dominated by the colonial powers and by the colonial powers of Europe having complete control over Africa. They projected the image of Africa negatively. They projected Africa always in a negative light. Jungles, savages, cannibals, nothing civilized. And, well, and naturally, it was so negative until you, it was negative to you and me. And you and I began to hate it. We didn't want anybody to tell us anything about Africa, much less call us an African. Uh, and, and, uh, and in hating Africa and hating the African, we ended up even hating ourselves without even realizing it. Because you can't hate the roots of a tree and not hate the tree. You can't hate your origin and not end up hating yourself. You can't hate Africa and not hate yourself. And you show me one of these people over here who have been thoroughly brainwashed, who has a negative attitude toward Africa, and I'll show you one that has a negative attitude toward himself. You can't have a, you can't have a negative attitude toward yourself, a positive a attitude toward yourself, and a negative attitude toward Africa at the same time. To the same degree that your attitude, that your understanding of an attitude toward Africa becomes positive, you'll find that your understanding of and your attitude toward yourself will also become positive. where the human race began. Nearly a billion people live here. And it's a continent with an incredible diversity of communities and cultures. Yet we know less of its history than almost anywhere else on Earth. But that's beginning to change. In the last few decades, researchers and archaeologists have begun to uncover a range of histories as impressive and extraordinary as anywhere else on Earth. It's a history which has been neglected for years, and it's largely without written records. But it is preserved for us in the gold and statues, in the culture, art and legends of the people. I'm beginning my search in the far north of the continent, in what is now known as the Sudan. I'm looking for the legendary kingdom of Nubia. Nubia is the traditional name for the northern part of Sudan, near the Egyptian border. For thousands of years, a civilization dominated the area there, in what's now the Eastern Sahara. It's first mentioned by the ancient Egyptians as a primitive outpost a source of slaves and treasure, dancing girls and wrestlers. To the Romans too, it was a barbarian wasteland. Yet these people were conquerors in their own right, ultimately defeated not by their rivals, but by their environment. Nubia has left us some of the most spectacular monuments, not only in Africa, but in the whole world. There are more pyramids here than there are in Egypt. This was a major civilization but its history is barely remembered. So what was Nubia actually like? How powerful was it? And what happened to it in the end? This is where I'm going to start my journey, right in the back of beyond. We've flown more than 250 miles north from Khartoum into the middle of the Nubian desert. What are you doing today? I can't believe we've come out here. It must, it feels like the middle of nowhere. It's one of the driest, most remote places I've ever been. But Mahmoud says that here, there's something that makes all the suffering we've gone through really worthwhile. So let's have a look. But why did you bring me out here? Actually, because this is a, 
it's very important place and here actually where our story will begin. It's a bell. It's a not a bell, but it's what we call the rock gong. So how old is this? It's not less than 5,000 5, BC. Years. Wow. Mm. So I'm playing a 5,000 BC instrument. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The actual sound is the natural result of the consistency of the rock, but it's been worn smooth by the actions of people playing it more than 7,000 years ago, long before the Romans, long before the pharaohs. This is a sign of human civilization. So would they sing along to this? I don't think that, but I think they can imagine more dancing than singing. More dancing. Mm. In the last few years, archaeologists have found hundreds of rock gongs like this in the Nubian desert. Possible evidence of a sizable population. I imagine you'd be able to hear it from a long distance. From a long, a long distance, and I think, and we think actually it's uh, the same as what we have now about the drum language in Africa. Yes. It's probably the, it was doing the same function at that time. Archaeologists think the people here may have used the rock gongs to communicate across the valleys. And that this is the beginning of the Nubian culture. But why here? This is the middle of one of the harshest deserts in the world. Mahmoud has something to show me. It's been a secret until recently. So now I will show you a very special thing. Oh, have a look at it. Oh, wow. That's amazing, it's cattle. Yeah. And that, how old is that? Something like 5,000, 6,000 BC. <gasps> BC, 5,000, 6,000. It's just astounding. When, when were these discovered? Uh, it's uh, just last March, can you imagine? <laughs> last like, March? Uh, we are in August. Five, so not many five, people five have months seen months ago. Yeah, you are the second, I said, the second after the, the mission who discovered the site. Really? Really. You what are the second really? to be here. Rock art is the oldest form of pictorial representation known. Research has shown that the pictures are unlikely to be just a depiction of everyday life. Instead, they concentrate on subjects that are of great significance to the people who made them. So I'm amazed to discover that out here, deep in the Nubian desert, they should be making images of cattle. But this is desert, though. But it uh, was in the desert uh, in seven or uh, 6,000 uh, BC. Mahmoud tells me it's a story of catastrophic climate change. Recent research has shown that some 7,000 years ago, most of the Sahara was in fact green. You can see the outlines of dry valleys or wadis. They were once big rivers which flowed into the Nile. And between them stretched grassland savannas of the kind that you have to go much further south to see today. So this area here, once upon a time would have had grass in it, it would have been lush, it would have supported cattle, and or probably complex communities. Yes, as well. and even wild animals. What what kind of animals might have? Yeah, actually, based on the rock drawings we have around here, we have uh, lions, we have uh, elephants, we have giraffe. So the, the the wildlife and the ecology of sub-Saharan Africa yeah. once existed. It, yes, that's amazing. Mm. And this is the proof of that. Yeah. So you can imagine sort of the cattle mm -hmm. well with a stretch of the imagination the cattle in this valley mm -hmm. the river just down there yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and people someone at some point coming up here mm -hmm. and with one of these stones just and making this depicting all this uh, kind of uh, drawings yes it's uh, amazing yes. Mm -hmm. yes. maybe the same people who play the the rock gong 
are the same who depict these uh, drawings here. Over the last few decades, archaeologists have uncovered the remains of an impressive city here, dating from around 2000 BC. This extraordinary structure looms like a man-made mountain over the ruins. Karma, it's kind of a development of the community who make the rock art. So we have here not like more organization. At the heart of this great city was a huge mud brick structure known as the Dufufa. It's the oldest known mud brick building in Africa and one of the largest. But it has no rooms. It's a solid block of masonry. They've actually built a piece of geography because it's absolutely solid mud. And what, what, what is it? And what, what might it have been used for? I believe that it's something associated with rituals. It's something like a temple or something like this. There's a small museum here with some of the finds from the excavations which give a flavour of the Nubian culture. And even when it's laid out like this, with the artefacts numbered off and catalogued, you can see quite how distinctive it is. Take the pottery. Archaeologists now know that people were making pottery here even before they began to plant crops, and long before ancient Egypt. The polished surfaces and black rims imitate the forms of polished drinking gourds I've seen and used elsewhere in Africa. It's extremely finely made, but it's done entirely by hand. They weren't using a potter's wheel for this. And the extraordinary thing is that this technique can still be found today, 4,000 years on. Everywhere you go around here, you see these characteristic water jars. They aren't mass produced in a factory. Instead, they're made by women in a local village. Just gathering some um, go poo. I think it is, which apparently is used in the mixture with the clay. And this is a village across the Nile from where we've been staying, where they create these amazing clay pots. And we're being shown by one of the local women how they actually do that from the point of kneading the clay to the finished product. I've done some pottery myself, and I know from hard experience that this technique is actually extremely difficult. It's as sophisticated as the mud brick architecture of the Dufufa. This technique may be ancient, but it's perfectly adapted to the conditions here. The red slip is designed to get the surface of the pot just right, porous enough for slow evaporation to keep the contents cool. These continuities of tradition and practice are an even more important insight into the culture of ancient Nubia, because the Nubians of Kerma never developed writing. Although the Nubian kingdom is long gone, it still exerts a pull. And these ruins have really affected me. In a sense, Kerma is the lost kingdom that I'd always dreamt of seeing. It's every bit as spectacular as anything that I've seen in Egypt. Four thousand years ago, the Nubians of Kerma were apparently thriving with their great mud brick monument, their herds of cattle and a sizable population. So why did they disappear? And where did they go? Water was the key to this Nubian kingdom. It provided the lush, fertile land on which their cattle herding society was based. It was a different story for Nubia's northern neighbours, the Egyptians. Their lack of pastoral land had led to the development of irrigation technology, drawing as much water as they could from the Nile to transform their parched desert soil. 
But even with this technology, it was a lot harder for them to create the rich greenery that Nubia had at this time in abundance, thanks to the rivers which ran through it. Nubia was a tempting target for the ambitious pharaohs. There were frequent raids and retaliations. Then, around 1500 BC, the records show us that the Egyptians invaded. Their target wasn't just Kerma. They continued another 180 miles along the Nile to a place called Jebel Barkum. Mahmoud and I are following the Egyptians' invasion route up the River Nile. Our objective is the same as the ancient pharaohs, the apparently symbolic mountain of Jebel Barkal. You can see that the, there is also a kind of feature on the mountain itself, like uh, this very interesting pinnacle here. If you can just see from the top, like a crown on the head of a cobra. Um, I'm not seeing a cobra, I must admit. Can you, can, you... you can see just, if you look at the binnacle, on the top, this is a, like a crown. That's it, okay. And you can see just beneath, the, like uh, this size, <laughs> you can see a mouse of a cobra and even you can, if you concentrate, you oh, can I'm see like a part it. of the eye. I think, so we're looking at something which is sitting like that and you can imagine a sort of exactly. dancing exactly. cobra exactly. and on its head. Yes. But and there's a crown. Wearing a crown, long crown. The, I the, see the it. crown of the, the kingship. I see it. To the ancient Egyptians, the rearing cobra was a symbol of kingship. And here was a natural sculpture which signaled to them, it seems, that within the mountain dwelt Amun, king of the Egyptian gods. They felt that justified their conquest of Nubia, and so they built an enormous temple to Amun at the foot of the mountain. How did the Nubians feel about the Egyptians actually being here? At that time, the Nubia was uh, completely uh, controlled by the Egyptians. It does seem a little bit like colonialism. Exactly. It's, uh, for the, at that time, for uh, the Egyptians, just looking at the Nubian as a, as a barbaric savage. Egyptian images at the time of the conquest are explicit about the subjugation of the Nubian people. They clearly regarded them as inferior. The Egyptians they used to call uh, Nubia before, uh, during that time as uh, the, the miserable Nubia. Miserable Nubia. Yeah. The images also make it clear that the Egyptians made the most of Nubia's natural resources and demanded riches as well as respect. Here the Nubians are bringing tribute, gold, ivory, along with wild animals, monkeys and leopard skins. And of course cattle are prominent. They even seem to have imported Nubian wrestlers to entertain them like gladiators. The people who built Kerma's magnificent buildings had, it seemed, been reduced to slaves. Or certainly that's what the Egyptians wanted everyone to think. There's a suggestion that even the name by which we know them is pejorative. The word Nuba originally meant slave. The Egyptians had painted the Nubians as mere slaves. What Mahmoud wants to show me is that the story isn't so simple. The Egyptians only ruled Nubia for just a few centuries. And there's hard evidence that the Nubians are able to get their own back on their conquerors. But surrounded by all these massive Egyptian remains, I find that hard to believe. Mahmoud says that if I had any lingering doubt that the Nubians turned the tables on the Egyptians, that that would be completely extinguished by having a look at 
what's in here. It's a temple, apparently built by a Nubian ruler called Tahaka in around 700 BC. As you can see here, depiction of the holy mountain, Jabal Barat, with the pinnacle on the shape of cobra oh, with the sun disk. On so that, that is where we actually sat, just yes. under, at the bottom of that And that's mountain. exactly where we are now here, just beneath, on the, beneath oh. the pinnacle itself, here inside the mountain. And we have here Amun, depiction of Amun. Actually the, inside? The inside the mountain, dueling. In here? Yes. And in front of it, we have the Harka, giving offering to Amun. So Taharka? representing the people here. Yes. But what these images show is that Tahaka wasn't just a ruler of Nubia. He was also a pharaoh of Egypt. The conquered had become the conquerors. He was one of a whole dynasty of Nubian pharaohs, which ruled over the entire Nile Valley under the auspices of Amun. And uh, Tahaka wearing the crown with uh, two cobras, which means that he is the king of the two lands. Yeah, astonishing. Yeah. Because usually these things are so ambiguous and that you have to make a bit of a leap of faith with history or archaeology. Yeah. This is absolutely categorical. And suddenly I'm seeing that snake again. These are black pharaohs, Nubians part of that lost kingdom of Nubia. But they didn't just rule over Nubia, they also ruled over Egypt as one continuous kingdom. These hieroglyphs show how Taharka celebrated his joint Nubian-Egyptian kingdom in the sanctuary of this temple. On the one side, he depicted the Nubian gods. And there is a wall here. With the Egyptian deities on the other. This black African civilization held sway from the upper Nile all the way to the Lebanon for over a century. These statues, discovered only a few years ago, Give us a portrait of the Nubian pharaohs in all of their self-confidence. These people ruled the whole area from here down in the Nubian territory right the way up into Egypt. And you can tell that by looking at their headdress. These two snakes, one for Nubian, one for Egypt. And you can tell how threatening they were to the Egyptians because they all at some point had their heads knocked off. Just look at them. And though they were unable to keep their hold on Egypt, the Nubian kingdom survived for centuries afterwards. But now they had acquired some Egyptian habits. From this time onward, Nubian rulers would be buried in pyramids like the pharaohs of old. There are more pyramids in Sudan than in Egypt. But this wasn't simple imitation. It had been centuries since Egyptian rulers used pyramids, and these pyramids are of a very different shape. This was the Nubians celebrating their own glory. But the Nubians had another greater enemy than the Egyptians, the environment. At the time of Taharqa, around 700 BC, the archaeological records show that the desert was approaching ever closer, and Kerma itself had lost its grazing land. The pressure of the desert meant that the heartland of the Nubian kingdom now moved further south, another 350 miles along the Nile, around a place called Meroe. And although the Egyptians had left their mark on the Nubian culture, there's evidence here also of more ancient Nubian beliefs. 
I can see the Egyptian influence in the shape of this temple. But the relief sculpture on the walls expressed a decidedly un-Egyptian worldview. By 200 BC, the Egyptian god Horus has been demoted to the back of the line. So this is in the line of seniority? Exactly. Even the great Amun of Jebel Barkal is playing second fiddle to the completely non-Egyptian war god, Apodemak. He's more senior, shown presenting the sign of kingship to the Nubian ruler. What I was showing him was, was this uh, picture here of these uh, statues that were found over in Egypt, Upper Egypt, of black men that were placed there or carved out of solid granite thousands of years ago. And if you notice, he didn't ever turn it toward the camera. He kept it down. Well, I started to turn it toward the camera, but I didn't. I was trying to be polite. And uh, the, at that point. And, uh, but today in the Los Angeles Times on page two, they have this same picture. Uh, you look in the Lo today's Los Angeles Sunday Times and they have a, a story on page two about this temple over in Africa. They call it Egypt, but Egypt is in Africa. And uh, the value of which is so tremendous, it points out how the United Na Nations is trying to float a loan of around $30 million to save this temple from being covered with by the waters that will be brought up by this Aswan Dam that they're trying to build over there. And, and uh, this thing is so shrewdly done that the average Negro will re look at it and read it, and because it says Egypt, he never identifies it with him or him with it. It shows you how shrewd the white man is. And But when you all you have to do is look at the features of the thing, and you can see, brother, brother they got all the features that the white man says Negroes have. But because it is associated or connected with something of such value, archaeological and historic anthropological value, the white man tries to steal it for himself and says, no, these are white people, these aren't black people. And look at this for yourself. Look closely at it, and then, uh, and if you notice, you'll also read in there where the United States is on record as being against putting out the money necessary to save this archaeological uh, wonder. They're against it. And it tells you in the uh, paper that they're against it. They want to let it go on and go beneath the waves. There was a time when the America would be for preserving something like that. Because in, in those days, the black man was so dead mentally, he could look right at it and wouldn't know he was looking at himself. He looked right at it and wouldn't know he was looking at himself. And today, when we see a black man, we know that's a black man. Whether they call him an Egyptian, a re -Egyptian, or an Abgyptian. Don't care what they call him. All you got to be look like you, he's the same thing as you. And this man that they have here, brothers and sisters, it has nothing but the features of a pure black man. Also, uh, they tell me that there's uh, an exhibition going on in Los Angeles right now somewhere about King Tut. Where is that? Some kind of museum. Where is it? Exposition, where is it? Oh, Exposition Park. Uh, I saw King Tut's uh, uh, mummy, tomb, when I was in Egypt. And uh, whether, I don't know if they have the same one here, but if you go and see it, you'll find out that this King Tut, uh, whose mummy or uh, sarcophagus, whatever they call it, they have, it's as black as this boy. And the white man knows this. Every picture that they have of King Tut, he's not brown. No, he is black, brother, just like this. And uh, the, the black people who lived in that day had mastered science to such extent, had mastered chemistry to such extent that they could create colors that uh, the dye hasn't faded to this day. Now, you know, you know this. The white man got to paint his house every year. You got to paint yours, inside and out. You haven't got a piece of cloth at home that won't fade if you, if you put it in the sun. But yet these black people back there could make dye that has retained the color, same grade quality, right down to the, to the day from five and 6,000 years ago. They were master chemists. And uh, the, this tomb, and I guess this, rather, this, uh, what you call it, mummy, is gold encrusted. They had so much gold back then. In fact, those were the people who discovered gold. They knew what gold was. White men didn't know what gold was. And uh, they encrusted their mummies with gold and beautiful colors and, right. and just laid them there. And finally, when, they, when the white man discovered them, he was shook up. 
and wondered how could these people back so long ago supposed to be dumb know so much about so much no yeah know so much about so many things that he doesn't know about today and the and uh usually when he projects these findings these wonders these relics from the past when he projects them into this particular society now our poor dumb people number one they usually don't go and look at it you don't find very many negroes in museums no they don't you they go to the ballpark to the ball game and they don't even go to the zoo you seldom find negroes in a in a in a museum or in some place where there is something that's going to teach them something and again i'm not knocking negroes saying this i'm talking to you and me as minister john said there's no strangers here today we're having a little family chat and when you have a family chat you can talk the faults as well as the, the rather than the uh the liabilities as well as the assets and once you put, pull out these uh, liabilities you can correct them you, you, you can go out to any museum and you'll find white people, white women, white mothers, white parents taking their little children through the museum, showing them this and showing them that. Why, the, our women don't do that. And because you don't do that, you actually leave a vacuum in the mind of your child. So now, I don't know what this uh, uh, exhibition consists of, uh, of, this, of these uh, Egyptian relics that uh, on display out here. But as uh, Allah blessed me to see it when I was in Egypt at the uh, Cairo Museum, all of these splendors that belong to that ancient civilization along the Nile that has shot the white man uh, are relics right out of the past of the black. A new discovery which has not yet been published it relates directly to the black communities across America. I'm, after here, I'm going to Bimini. As she said, I'm also going to speak at the Washita Conference again in Louisiana about this. But before I tell you about that, people will say, well, big deal. So what? why is history important at all? History is extremely important. Imagine if, if I could take from each one of you as an individual everything you knew about your life up to last week and just erase it. Where would you be? You, you'd be lost. You, you'd be incompetent. You wouldn't know how to plan for the future. And you do the same thing with a people. If you erase their history or you don't tell enough about their past, they also become incompetent and they can't fulfill the future. And that's why a lot of people in the black community have felt, well, how come all of the dreams of the civil rights movement aren't yet fulfilled? And one reason is because this history is still suppressed. It still isn't taught, but there's been a recent discovery which is going to blow the lid off of all that, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, basically, what science has now found, although this is suppressed for the most part, there have been some great researchers. You have some wonderful books here, like by Evan Van Sertema, who's talking about these things. This is not taught in your public schools, although it will be. The history that the children are learning today is not going to be the history that's going to be taught in the next 25 years. It's going to be radically different. We now know for a fact that long before Columbus, there were four major migrations of blacks to the Americas, different parts of the Americas, for totally different reasons, totally separated from each other by many centuries. But nonetheless, there were these black you can call them migrations, but they were not entire. I'll describe, and you can make up your own mind what they were. The most recent of these took place about 400 years before Columbus was even born, and it's all outlined in a marvelous book over there. It's called The Golden Trade of the Moors. And it is now known that the West African Kingdom of Mali had huge fleets of merchant vessels, and that these kings these black kings of West Africa began sailing across the Atlantic to Mexico as early as 900 AD. Now, why did they do that? They did that for trade, not for conquest or invasion. They did this for trade. Mali was very wealthy in gold. They had lots of minerals. Some of the black kingdoms, they were called the Yoruba or the Benin. They were great workers in bronze. But the trouble with West Africa, and it's still a trouble today, not enough food famine. Somehow, the black kings of Mali had preserved this tradition of long before where there was this kingdom across the sea, a totally different one, 
was very hard to reach. You needed to have uh, excellent ships and good sailors, and nobody in Europe was doing it at this time. But if you cross that sea, this other kingdom across the Atlantic was very rich in a certain kind of food, which the people over there called maize. We now call corn. And these West African kings launched at least two major fleets, trading ventures, that went across the Atlantic 900 A.D. to about 1600 A.D. And they brought over their bronze work, and they taught the Mexican people, the ancient Mexican people, who were then known as the Mayas. The Mayas had built up a great kingdom of their own, but in 900 A.D. they were in decline. They were really on the outs. Nobody knows exactly why, but their society was in decline. They were losing all of their technology. Then this, these black fleets came across from West Africa, from Mali, and they uh, presented a lot of uh, gold work, bronze work, and in return, they came back with shiploads of corn, maize. Now, we know for sure that this actually happened because very recently, you'll see in the next issue of our magazine, not this issue, the next issue is coming out in about two weeks. This is part of the... The discoveries are happening so fast and furious, it's hard to keep track. They now have found that a certain type of maize or corn, which is growing in West Africa, has been growing there for many centuries, is not native to West Africa. It is a type of corn which comes from Mexico. could have only been brought over by these Mali seafarers over a thousand years ago. So this is a first concrete proof that they beat Columbus by centuries, and were not just on a voyage of exploration. They were going back and forth, bringing corn back. Now, why do we know about that? Well, this trade stopped abruptly 1600 A.D. 1600 A.D., the Spanish, the Portuguese, were on a real aggressive colonizing campaign, and they took over Africa, and they destroyed a lot of these kingdoms. And with the destruction of these kingdoms went all the knowledge in all the history of these past trades. This is a tremendous lesson for us because, you know, we are so proud of our American civilization. We think it will go on forever. But when a civilization falls, history tells us it takes almost all memory of it with it. Civilization is really very fragile. And that's why these lessons from the past are very, very important. If we want to preserve our civilization, we have to learn what happened to these others that crashed. In 1375, Spanish mapmakers are charting the known world. On a map of North Africa, they draw a picture of a man who has status. More gold than anyone else. And he makes all the rules. The text says, so abundant is the gold which is found in his country, that he is the richest and most noble king in the land. His name is Mansa Musa. A survey put Mansa Musa as the world's richest man of all time. They estimated his fortune at some $400 billion. For comparison, Bill Gates came 12th on the list, with something close to a quarter of Mansa Musa's wealth. Mansa Musa is one of the most incredible characters in history, and few of us have ever heard of him. Musa rules an immense African empire. Welcome to West Africa. I've traveled to the city of Bamako, the capital of Mali. Today, this is one of the poorest countries in the world, but it was once home to a mysterious empire awash in gold. Hi, I'm Hunter Ellis. For centuries, adventurers and explorers risked their lives crossing the Sahara to reach a place that has become synonymous with the remote and the exotic and a metaphor for the unattainable, the fabled Timbuktu. But what was it that gave the city its famous mystique? That's what I've come to find out. The legend of Timbuktu begins in the year 1324 when a huge caravan appears unannounced in the deserts outside Cairo. Emperor Mansa Musa is making his holy pilgrimage to Mecca, and he's doing it in style. His caravan includes 60,000 people and about 13 tons of gold. 
the Islamic world was amazed by this unknown black king who seemed rich beyond belief. Arab historians recorded that he spent so lavishly in Cairo, the Egyptian gold market crashed for years. Eventually, the stories reached Europe, spawning an obsession with Mansa Musa and his shadowy city of gold. A Spanish map from 1375 even shows the emperor sitting on his throne holding a nugget of gold. When Mansa Kanka Musa returned from his famous pilgrimage to Mecca, he brought back a vision to transform the jewel of his empire into a great capital of Islamic learning in the desert. He invited architects and scholars from the Middle East to build mosques and universities. Some of them still stand today. I returned to Timbuktu with a new appreciation. Islam has been the lifeblood of the city ever since, and it had a particular character that's still reflected today. Philippe Royce, an expert in Arab and Islamic history, takes me to visit a traditional Islamic school, or madrasa, where I can see it for myself. Islam in, in West Africa is very tolerant, and, and there is not the kind of problem you can find in other Islamic countries. Today, the word madrasa makes many people think of terrorist training camps full of hate. Here in Timbuktu, it couldn't be more different. The boys and girls in this school are studying together, following in the city's long tradition of tolerance and diversity. Philippe next takes me down the street to the Sankori Mosque to show me the full expression of this tradition. During the Middle Ages, this was the Harvard or Yale of the Muslim world. And after Kanka Musa's pilgrimage to Mecca, didn't yeah. Timbuktu just grow tremendously? Yes, exactly. And how many people were we talking about? There was about uh, 100,000 people. And how many of those were scholars? Quite a part of them. 25,000 yeah. 25, scholars? 000, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this was a, a city of great knowledge then. Yes, absolutely. It was absolutely incredible. It is unique, I think, in the world. Uh, so the, the city the developed such a reputation that scholars came from all over the Muslim world to study not only Islam, but astronomy, mathematics, history, and medicine. By the mid-16th century, Kanka Musa's dreams had come true. Timbuktu rivaled Cairo and even Mecca as a center of learning boasting over 150 schools. But if the golden age of Timbuktu is long gone, Philippe tells me that some of its treasures do remain. King Mansa Musa, who ruled the West African Empire of Mali, and in 1324-ish, he left his home and made the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. He brought with him an entourage of over a thousand people, some sources say 60,000, and most importantly, 100 camel loads of gold. I wish it had been donkeys so I could say he had 100 ass loads of gold, but no, camels. Right, so along the way, Mansa Musa spent freely and gave away lots of his riches. Most famously, when he reached Alexandria, at the time one of the most cultured cities in the world, he spent so much gold that he caused runaway inflation throughout the city that took years to recover from. He built houses in Cairo and in Mecca to house his attendants and as he traveled through the world, a lot of people, notably the merchants of Venice, no thought bubble, like actual merchants of Venice, right. They saw him in Alexandria and returned to Italy with tales of Mansa Musa's ridiculous wealth, which helped create the myth in the minds of Europeans that West Africa was a land of gold, an El Dorado, the kind of place you'd like to visit, and maybe, you know, in five centuries or so, begin to pillage. Thanks, Carl Bubble. So what's so important about the story of Mansa Musa? Well, first, it tells us that there were African kingdoms ruled by fabulously wealthy African kings, which undermines one of the many stereotypes about Africa, that its people were poor and lived in tribes ruled by chiefs and witch doctors. Also, since Mansa Musa was making the Hajj, we know that he was A, Muslim, and B, relatively devout. And this tells us that Africa, or at least Western Africa, was much more connected to the parts of the world we've been talking about than we generally are led to believe. Mansa Musa knew all about the places he was going before he got there, and after his visits, the rest of the Mediterranean world was sure interested in finding out more about his homeland. The Great Kings and Queens of Africa is presented by Anheuser-Busch to honor and preserve a part of the rich and proud African culture, and to cultivate a deeper understanding of the many contributions that history has made to the world. Alfonso I was the first ruler to modernize black Africa on a grand scale. He encouraged his people to learn Christianity and new skills in masonry, carpentry, and agriculture. 
Alfonso streamlined politics, established modern schools, and later became the first ruler to resist the slave trade. When Sunni Ali Burr came to power, Songhai was a small kingdom in the western Sudan. With a ferocious force, the warrior king won battle after battle, routing marauding nomads, seizing trade routes, and expanding, ever expanding his domain. He captured Timbuktu, bringing into the Songhai Empire a major center of commerce, culture, and Muslim scholarship. His greatness is still legendary among the Songhai people today. Askia the Great was a fair and deeply religious man who at times fought established tradition to rule in the best interest of his people. A devout Muslim, he ruled Songhai strictly according to Islamic law. Askia Muhammad Ture united the entire central region of Western Sudan with a government that is still revered today. A wise and beautiful woman from Nubia so captured the heart of the Pharaoh she changed the course of history. Ties, beauty, intellect, and will so took Pharaoh Amenhotep III. He defied his nation's priest and custom by proclaiming this commoner his great royal spouse. Amenhotep declared that as he had treated her in life, so should she be depicted in death as his equal. And so the colossal sculpture ordered for their temple thus portrays them as a pair of majestic monarchs, both proud, both noble, both. A strong leader and military innovator, Shaka is noted for revolutionizing Bantu warfare through standardized weapons and special tactics. Many enemies would flee at the mere sight of Shaka's troops. With cunning and confidence as his tools, Shaka united all tribes in South Africa against colonial rule. For hundreds of years, Nubia and Egypt had been at war. But Nefertari's marriage to King Remesis II, Pharaoh of Egypt, brought the fighting to an end. The marriage began as strictly a political move, but it later grew into one of the greatest royal love affairs in history. In fact, the temple which Ramesses built for her at Abu Sabah is one of the largest and most beautiful structures ever built to honor a wife and to celebrate peace. One of the greatest monarchs of the Congo, King Shamba, had no greater desire than to preserve the peace. He designed an extremely democratic government featuring a system of checks and balances that represented all Bushongo people. Also, Shamba promoted the arts and crafts to the highest level during his reign. Regarded as one of the greatest generals of all time, Hannibal and his powerful African armies came close to defeating the mighty Roman Empire. His audacious moves and tactics have been studied and successfully imitated as recently as in World War II. The genius of Hannibal brought Carthage great prosperity and prestige. The identity of the Queen of Sheba has long been debated, but indications are that she was the Ethiopian Queen, Makeda. According to legend, she was fascinated with the wisdom of the great King Solomon of Israel. Upon meeting, the King and Queen were equally intrigued with one another. Fondness grew into love, and their union produced history's longest line of royalty descendants. Returning to Ethiopia, Makeda's influence transcends centuries as the Judeo-Christian tradition remains embedded in modern Ethiopia. Teaching a doctrine of love and peace, Akhenaten was the first ruler in recorded history to believe in the concept of one God. He and his wife, Queen Nefertiti, changed Egyptian culture so radically that their influence was felt centuries later through more natural visual art styles and a fuller, warmer language for poetry, songs, and storytelling. At the age of 16, this great Nubian king led his armies against the invading Assyrians in defense of his ally, Israel. It earned him a place in the Bible in the books of Isaiah and 2 Kings. Despite continuous warfare, Tahaka was able to build overwhelming projects throughout his empire, including a temple with carved images over 100 feet high. The Egyptian queen ascended to power at the age of 17 to become one of Africa's greatest female rulers. Intelligent and witty, 
Her graceful nature and stunning personality were valuable diplomatic attributes. Striving to elevate Egypt to world supremacy, Cleopatra persuaded Julius Caesar and Mark Anthony to renounce their Roman allegiances to fight on behalf of Egypt. Each, however, met his death before Cleopatra's dreams of conquest were realized. Disheartened, Cleopatra pressed an asp to her breast, ending the life of the world's most celebrated African queen. Ose Tutu was the founder and the first king of the Asante nation in what is now Ghana. He was able to convince a half a dozen suspicious chiefs to join their states under his leadership. According to legend, this occurred when the golden stool descended from heaven and came to rest on Osei Tutu's knees, signifying his choice by the gods. The kingdom would endure for two centuries. Menelik was the overshadowing figure of his time in Africa. He converted a group of independent kingdoms into the strong, stable empire known as the United States of Abyssinia, or Ethiopia. Resisting European colonization and uniting the opposing kingdoms made him one of the great statesmen of African history. Though dead for nearly a hundred years, Nihanda remains what she was when alive, the single most important person in the modern history of Zimbabwe. When English settlers invaded in 1896, Nihanda and other leaders declared war. At first, they achieved great success. But as supplies ran short, so did battlefield victories. Nihanda was eventually captured and executed. Although gone, she was not forgotten, and is still referred to as Zimbayu, grandmother, Nihanda by Zimbabwean patriots. Kama distinguished his reign by extracting technological innovations from the Europeans while resisting their attempts to colonize the Kwana land. Advancements included the building of schools, scientific cattle breeding, and a police corps which practically eliminated crime. In 1875, Kama appealed to Queen Victoria of England to protest English settlement in his country. The English honored Kama and his call for continued freedom for Bikwana land. For half a century, the Basutu people were ruled by the wise and just founder of their nation, King Mosweswe. The Basutu had to fight for their survival against plundering Africans, European colonialists, and particularly the Boers. As the relentless Boers were about to annihilate the Basotos, Mosweswe persuaded the British to make Masutu land a protectorate, a diplomatic coup that helped to assure his nation's survival and to assure Mosweswe a place in African history. Nzinga of Angola was an astute diplomat and an excellent military leader. To arrest the swelling influx of slave-hunting Portuguese, she waged war for nearly 30 years. Because of her quest for freedom and relentless drive to bring peace for her people, Nzinga remains a glimmering symbol of inspiration. Samori launched a conquest to unify West Africa into a single state spanning 100,000 square miles. In each city, Samori built a mosque a testimonial of his devotion to Islam. During the 18-year conflict with France, powerful Samori continually frustrated the Europeans. His astute military prowess prompted some of France's greatest commanders to entitle the African monarch the Black Napoleon of the Sudan. The people of Dahomey often referred to their monarch, Behanzen, as the King Shark for his strength and wisdom. Behanzen maintained a strong army to defend his nation's sovereignty, including a division of 5,000 female warriors who were noted for their formidable zeal in battle. A fond lover of the humanities, Behanzen is credited with some of the finest song and poetry ever produced in Dahomey. Mr. O'Connor. What is your real name? Malcolm. Malcolm X. Uh, is that your legal name? As far as I'm concerned, it's my legal name. Have you been to court to establish the I don't, I, you know, I didn't have to go to court to be called Murphy or Jones or Smith. Excuse me for answering you this way. That's if right. a Chinese person were to say his name was Patrick Murphy, uh, you would look at him like he's insane because uh, Murphy is an Irish name, uh, a European name, or the name that uh, has a Caucasian or, or a white background. And a yellow person, Chinese is a yellow man, 
and uh, he has nothing to do or no connection whatsoever with the name Murphy. And if it doesn't look proper for a person who is yellow or Chinese to be walking around named Murphy or Jones or Johnson or Bunch or Powell, uh, I think it would be just as improper for a black person or the so-called Negro in this country, as we're taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, to walk around with these names. And therefore, he teaches us that during slavery, the same slave master who owned us uh, put his last name on us to denote that we were his property. So that when you see a Negro today who's named Johnson, if you go back in his history, you'll find that he was once his grandfather or one of his forefathers was owned by a white man who was named Johnson. His name is Bunch. His, his grandfather was owned by a I white man point. that was uh, named Bunch. Would you mind telling me what your father's last name was? My father didn't know his last name. My father got his last name from his grandfather, and his grandfather got it from his grandfather, who got it from the slave master. The real names of our people were destroyed well, during was slavery. Any, was there any line, uh, any point in, in the uh, genealogy of your family when you did have to use the last name? And if so, what was it? The last name of my forefathers yeah. was taken from them when they were brought to America and made slaves. And then the name of the slave master was given, which we refuse. We reject that name today. You mean, you, mean to... you won't even tell me what your father's supposed last name was or gifted last name was? I never acknowledge it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about the, the status of, of Elijah Muhammad. First of all, is he ill? I spoke to him today. He is in better health than he has been. He's suffering from asthmatic bronchitis. Is that why he didn't attend your rally on last Tuesday? Yeah, the only reason that he didn't attend was his uh, ill condition. And the weather here, especially on that particular day, was of such nature that it would have been almost insane for him to come. Well, now, did you hold that meeting last Tuesday because it coincided with the uh, general election, the primary election? I think if you study the history of Mr. Muhammad's work and religious work in this country, he's been, we've had our convention on February the 26th every year for, I think, the past 33 years. Well, now, while, while you don't uh, care to discuss your former name or the name that the slave master gave to your antecedents, uh, it is a matter of record that uh, Muhammad's last name was Poole, Elijah Poole. No, that's the name that his slave master gave to his uh, grandfather or great-grandfather, but that's not his name. Well, his mother and father thought when they called him Elijah Poole that that was his name. They right? didn't know any better. Well, if they didn't know any better or not, that, they thought that was his name. Yes, sir, but sir... So what I'm trying to find out is when did he cease to be Elijah Poole and get to be Elijah Muhammad? In 1931, I think it was, in Detroit, he was taught the true history of our people and made aware at that time that he was wearing an English name, and by not being an Englishman, he looked out of place. And uh, his teacher gave him the name that he's wearing today, Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad. All right, now when did he become what he purports to be in your literature, the son of Allah? I've never heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad referred to as the son the of Allah. The prophet of Allah. Okay. I've never heard him referred to as the prophet of Allah. What do you refer to him Messenger as? of Allah. All right, the messenger of Allah, and I appreciate the correction yes I mean, he says that a prophet is somebody who predicts the future and he's not predicting the future whereas a messenger is someone who carries a message that has been given to him by one who authors that message Why right, now who gave him the message and to whom is it supposed to be delivered master w f muhammad the one who taught him is the author of the message he gave it to the honorable elijah muhammad which makes him the messenger and he's to deliver that message of truth and righteousness to the 20 million American so-called Negroes, which means he's to teach us the truth which will awaken us and then show us how to live a life of righteousness which will automatically qualify us for recognition as human beings by all other righteous human beings here on this earth. Well, now, one other question. Uh, with reference to what Mr. Hurlbut asked you a little bit ago, uh, you took a very moderate position of... Uh, of wanting independence without having any hatred for the for the whites is that is, do I understand that correctly hatred is not involved in it whatsoever well I recall uh, in a recent plane crash I mean two or three years ago or less than that a charter flight on Air France uh, in which a group of people from Atlanta Georgia uh, were as they say in the uh, business uh, as they took off from uh, from Arley Field, and you were quoted at that time as expressing great gratification that this tragedy had occurred. Do you recall that? I recall it. 
What did you uh, say? Was, Do you remember? Uh, the press misinterpreted it and misrepresented it. What did you say? They said that it was made at a Muslim meeting. It wasn't. It was made at a rally of Negroes, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, and otherwise in Los Angeles, who were rallying to protest the brutal shooting of uh, seven unarmed Negroes and what did you by say? heavily armed white policemen in the city of Los Angeles. And because we are a people who have been taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to never carry weapons of any kind, but to get on God's side and rely on God to fight our battles for us, uh, at the time that these brothers were shot down so brutally, I pointed out at the <laughs> funeral of the brother who died that God would step in and take a hand in giving us some form of justice for the brutal killing of our brother. And when the plane crashed in France, uh, I pointed out to the crowd at this rally that this was an act of God showing his wrath or complete uh, resentment over the brutal uh, form of injustice that had been inflicted upon our poor unarmed brothers. Were you saying Sir, that or do Billy you believe Graham, that? At that time, Dr. Billy Graham was in a crusade in Chicago. And the press, your papers here in this city, uh, quoted Billy Graham of also saying that that pl uh, plane crash was an act of God. And if you take time to check the newspapers, I think that you'll find that this is correct. But no one thought that Billy Graham was so wrong when he attributed the crash of this plane to his God. But when we say that it come from our God, then we're looked upon as being, well, you know, that, outrageous. I know, but you took the position that uh, this was a matter of satisfaction to you for an injustice that, done against you, and I think that that's a trifle severe. We did not think that it was a coincidence that 120 of, of the whites on this plane came from the state of Georgia, a state that has the worst record in history in the history of America for the mistreatment of black people uh, in this country. Worse than Mississippi? Uh, well, uh, they maybe are a little less... Hippo, uh, Mississippi is a little less hypocritical today than Georgia, but both of them are still practicing the same thing. Uh, now the, the whites in Georgia bite Negroes with a smile, whereas they used to bite them with a growl. But they're still being bitten, and we don't think that it is, that it is any worse to be bitten with a smile than it is to be bitten with a growl. Mr. Calvert. While we're on the subject of uh, Mississippi, what is uh, your organization's position of what happened in Mississippi uh, in the past Such six as months? what? such as the uh, James Meredith incident and the enrollment of him in the university. Well, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wants justice for every one of the 20 million so-called Negroes. And to just take one Negro and stick him in, in college uh, with, uh, with the aid of the six, I think it's six, uh, 15,000 troops and at a cost of $6,000 is a disgrace. It's a waste of taxpayers' money. It's a farce. It's hypocrisy. Because if it's right for uh, one Negro to be forced into that university, then every Negro in the state of Mississippi who is qualified has the same right to go to that university. And if the government is not uh, ready and willing to uh, enforce the right of every Negro in the state of Mississippi, then, uh, in my opinion, sir, it's only hypocrisy to pretend that uh, they are for justice uh, by pushing one Negro in and blowing it up all over the world to make it look like they're solving the problem when millions of black people in that state are still going to uh, segregated schools and getting an inferior education.